do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their words had fought no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright, their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. You made a mistake. At one time in your life, you made a mistake. You let your anger get the better of you. Was it an injustice against you, or someone you care for, or frustration, or perhaps jealousy? When it gets the better of us, anger can transform into rage, often self-destructive and poisonous. But what if you could control it, master that energy? Understanding this journey is shown with the chief librarian of the Blood Angels chapter, the Lord of Death, Mephiston. Perhaps the most powerful librarian amongst all of the forces of the Legiones Astartes in the 42nd millennium. Mephiston carries the burden of great power, but this was not always true. Like all space marines, he was once a mortal man, born amongst the humans of Baal in the Ultima Segmentum. The world of Baal, when first encountered by humanity, was home to a mysterious unknown Xenos race. The truth of their form had been lost to time, but what remains in the record spoke of this Xenos' beliefs in the duality of their souls. They worshipped winged forms, one of the light, one of dark, locked in eternal conflict. Anything more is lost after they were wiped out by human colonization. During the dark age of technology, Baal along with its two moons were isolated by warp storms. However, these isolated Baalite civilizations survived, and when the storms lifted, a golden age began that saw the world reach its zenith. Though perhaps never a world of bountiful resources, the Baal system still teemed with familiar creatures, such as eagles, scorpions, and coastal sea creatures. However, at the onset of the Age of Strife, Baal and its moons were isolated once more. Unable to support their native population with the conditions on world, famine gripped the system. The moon of Baal Secundus demanded that they, the more populous world, be granted the protection of the orbital facilities of Baal Primus, and for that moon to be evacuated. Baal Primus refused, war broke out, and the system became ravaged by nuclear war. Cities burned, oceans boiled, humanity Flora and fauna became mutated under the effects of radiation. The system had burned because of human greed, but by some miracle humanity survived, resorting to scavenging through the dust of their ancestors' great civilization. The human survivors over generations regressed into tribes, the most prominent being known as the Blood, who were forced into a nomadic lifestyle by the other inhabitants of the worlds. Foul mutant hordes roamed the surfaces, preying on any who wandered around the irradiated plains and deserts. With a dark and dangerous existence, the last society of Baal became isolated, recalling the stories of old, more like myths. Strangely enough, these themes of duality and angelic beings began to pop up amongst the stories of these tribes echoing the Xenos civilization that had existed millennia ago. Stagnation and danger was all that the Baal system had to offer for many centuries, until the near end of the 31st millennium. On one fateful day, a gestation capsule descended from the sky, crashing into the moon of Baal Secundus. It would be the tribe of blood that would discover amongst the wreckage a perfect boy with angel wings the Primarch Sanguinius. Horace gave a rueful nod 
and drew his sword, a massive blade of oiled steel and adamantium. You will try, he said, but today you will face the Emperor's sons and his warriors. We are the Lunar Wolves, and this legion is the anvil upon which you will be broken. From high overhead there was a low crackle, and a sound like distant thunder and sonic booms from the upper atmosphere that reached the desert floor. We are the anvil. Now behold the hammer. What descended from the heavens was the ninth Legiones Astartes, the Blood Angels of Sanguinius. Formerly the Revenant Legion, the Blood Angels are perhaps one of the most beloved and highly regarded warriors in the entire Imperium. Though this was not always the case, as during the Unification Wars and early conquests of the Great Crusade, the pre-Sanguinius Legion had a bloody reputation. Perhaps it was something in their blood, because the Revenant Legion was known for its brutality, efficiency and lack of mercy. It was only in the reunification with their Primarch that in essence the soul of the Legion was saved. It was the journey and morality of Sanguinius, fostered in his early life, that helped save them. When Sanguinius was stolen from the Emperor's side, he was transported to the irradiated moon of Bar Secundus. It would be amongst the sheltered people of the blood that would come to accept and take in this mysterious boy. The tribes showed him love and community that in many dark times became his armour. He became their angelic protector, garnering worship as an angel akin to past myths. Having long foreseen his father's coming and the many consequences of that meeting, Sanguinius came to meet the emperor alone without the long train of worshippers or the warriors pledged to his service. Alone, he fell to his knees before his father and asked only for the lives of his followers, fearing the wrath of a man who was sworn to topple all religions. It was here that uniquely the emperor granted his son's wish and the system of Baal joined the Imperium of Man, but allowing its culture of light and dark and angelic myths to continue. Over many years, Sanguinius transformed the Ninth Legion into the Blood Angels, a union of the fury of the Terran Marines for the noble customs of the Baalites. Even long after the loss of their Primarch, at the end of the Horus Heresy, the teachings and attributes of Sanguinius prevail. Over millennia, aspirants from the Tribe of Blood have given their sons to join one of the greatest chapters amongst all of the Empyrean. Dawned in blood-red armour, these warriors of Baal venture out to some of the most deadly war zones across the Imperium, inspiring even other Astartes with their presence. For who could be afraid when beholding the hammer of the angels upon their anvil? It is the 41st millennium. For 10,000 years, the United Tribes of the Blood have held dominion over the irradiated lands of the Baal system. Through the millennia, Baal and its moons have seen the construction of a bastion in which the tribes now call home, most people living simple and ordinary lives. But for those that strive for purpose and duty, they will attempt to join the ranks of the emperors of mankind's elites his blood angels. Whether it was pride, nobility, or desperation, the reason for joining will only be known to him, and during the mid-M41, a boy named Calistarius decided that he would join the ranks of the blood angels. But Calistarius, like all the others, would have to prove that he was worthy to reach the place of challenge by journeying through the vast, hostile deserts and a series of canyons infested with fire scorpions and thirst water. Many young boys would leave their families to die a horrific death at this very first hurdle. Luckily, Calistaria survived and finally reached the place of challenge to find gladiatorial contests. For the hundreds that made it to the contest, they would compete and fight until just 50 remained, either by death or giving up. These 50, however, had not completed their trials yet 
as they must observe a vigil of 72 hours without rest. Those that fail and fall asleep are taken away, becoming the mind-wiped servants of the chapter. At the end of the vigil, the remaining aspirants are offered a chalice containing a small portion of Sanguinius' own blood. After the blood of the Primarch flows within, the aspirants fall into a coma, entombed by the blood servitors inside the caskets of the Hall of Sarcophagi. Callistarius had passed the test of body, and now he would go under the test of soul. He and his brother aspirants would be locked within life-supported tombs whilst they were injected continuously with the blood of Sanguinius for an entire year. As Calistarius slept, many of the other boys would die, either from waking up too early and becoming insane from their dark and claustrophobic existence, or rejecting the gene seed and mutating into a catatonic mess. But only Callistarius and a handful of others proved that they were strong in both body and heart. Combining with the gene seed of Sanguinius, Callistarius had survived and he became a blood angel. But more than that, Callistarius was no ordinary recruit, for he possessed a gift found rarely amongst all of the tribes of man. He was a psyker, one gifted with the sight and powers of the Immaterium. Young Calistarius had left behind all that he knew, family and friends to become a blood angel, a human elevated to an Astartes warrior. As a member of the Librarius, he was expected to hone his psychic abilities through constant practice and study for use in battle, but also to protect himself from the powers of the warp. He would train and improve these skills over the coming decades, but more was expected of him than just being a warrior. Sanguinius was the Primarch who wanted his sons to be so much more, and the teaching and creeds he passed down to them have ensured that for 10,000 years, the Blood Angels have been well versed in art, poetry, and creative expressions. Like how the Primarch saved the soul of the early Legion, there is an innate belief that life can be changed for the better. This belief can be seen in everything that they do. They strive for excellence, be it in their works of art, martial discipline, or study. It must have been a wondrous thing to go from a simple tribesman to all this amazing civilization. In fact, Callistarius had never heard true music until he was elevated, something I'm sure many of us could not fathom living without. A strive for excellence was instilled within Callistarius. Many of his battle brothers and friends will come to see this great determination on the Space Hulk, the Sin of Damnation. In 589M41, a young Lexicanium, originally battle brother Callistarius, was chosen as an honorary member of First Company under Captain Raphael during the cleansing of the infamous Space Hulk. The Librarian's powerful mind and supernatural abilities had set him apart from his battle brothers, but this was an isolation that he always seems to encourage. Being a psyker, Callistarius had faced horrors most marines would find unfathomable. Though he had close friends, such as his Lexicanian mentor Gaius Raciulus and the sanguinary priest Albinus, he found it difficult to look upon his fellow marines with any understanding or empathy. In truth, they could never understand, but nevertheless he stood by his battle brothers as they approached this enormous space hulk. The Blood Angels company began their operation, clearing sector by sector, until Callistarius was shown the reason he was brought along. They found a mortally injured Blood Angel in old power armor. Callistarius' first thought was to save this catatonic brother but in reality the situation was that he would die before any true help could arrive. So in turn, Calistarius performed his duty and psychically delved into the mind of his comatose brother, seeping through scrambled visions and memories. Vespario was his name, and the reason for his injuries were an unsettling mystery. Just as he warned his superior officer, Sergeant Dionysus, he was told to abandon this fallen angel and retreat back to the beachhead. 
but Callistaris could not let this happen. Captain Raphael, this is Lexicanium Callistarius. I must speak with you urgently. Callistarius? said Raphael, his voice deep and rich, and he spoke calmly despite the unorthodox nature of Callistarius's communication. This is the command channel. What has happened to Sergeant Dionys? His transponder reports normal, vital signs. The sergeant is unharmed, Captain. We cannot withdraw. Not yet. I must continue my psychic scan of Brother Vespario. Abort the reinforcement wave until I have completed my probe. There was a long pause before Raphael replied. Second wave is being dispatched in 40 seconds. You have 30 to convince me. Calistarius quickly told the captain of his suspicions concerning Vespario's behaviour. Raphael listened without interruption, and when the librarian finished, he asked a simple question. Are you willing to stake your honour and good name on this instinct? Absolutely, brother captain. By time the Lexicanium delved back into Vespario until eventually he saw a gene stealer patriarch infused with the Cult Mechanicum's technology and a navigator's third eye. A time capsule, protected by Vespario to warn those who would find him two centuries later. With no time to waste, the Blood Angel stormed the bridge and slayed the Patriarch. Calistares had defied his superior officer and put other brothers at risk. Some may call it arrogance, but it came from a place of concern for his brothers and honour for Vespario. Maybe he had more empathy for his brothers than he was willing to admit. Honour, courage, and nobility are traits that we as humans strive to emulate. Many teachings from our own world through the philosophy, religion, and wisdom encourage these qualities. But much like we see in Zoroastrianism and Abrahamic faiths, we see all this good, this light, is contrasted by darkness. For all of the admirable qualities of the Blood Angels they have throughout their culture and gene seed, it is shadowed by the child of fear, anger. For over 10,000 years, those of Blood Angel descent have suffered a terrible curse from the psychic imprint left by Sanguinius's death. All of the blood can feel this pit of anger and bloodlust deep within them. If they lose themselves to it, they believe that they are Sanguinius himself, fighting for his life against his brother Horus during the Battle of Terror. This insanity is known as the Black Rage. When a space marine is overcome by the Black Rage, his sanity is snapped, and he is consumed by anger, hatred, fury and nothing else. As the Marine relives Sanguinius' memories, he also taps into a small portion of his unearthly power, boosting his strength and vitality to superhuman levels. Many thousands of brothers have been lost to this curse, none surviving. There is no coming back, as many lost friends and battle brothers are locked away in the Tower of the Lost, on the Blood Angel's homeworld until they finally die. But rather than face a slow, rage-filled death, those chapters descended from the Blood Angels will form those who have newly succumbed to the Black Rage into a special unit known as the Death Company. They paint their armour black, crossed with red, signifying the wounds of Sanguinius, and are usually led by Death Company chaplains, who are able to communicate orders to these lost warriors. With the very last tether of obedience in the marines, they are sent on suicide missions, hoping for a quick and honourable death. This flaw has been a great shame for the numerous chapters of the blood, one that they wish to keep a secret out of fear of condemnation of heresy. For every marine, chaplain, or even librarius like Calistarius, they feel that curse deep within, 
constantly having to suppress it lest it break you. But Callistarius, like all Blood Angels, knows that it's only a matter of time until they lose that war, and hopefully you can die as yourself before that day comes. Everything would change for Callistarius in the Second War for Armageddon, a conflict between the Imperium of Man and the Orc warboss Gazgol Mag Urg Rukthraka that took place between 941M41 through 943M41. The war was fought on the hive world of Armageddon in the Segmentum Solar, where Gazgold Thraka launched an Orc War, consisting of five separate Orc tribes in an attempt to seize the planet for themselves. Three Space Marine chapters were involved, including the Blood Angels, Salamanders and the Ultramarines, along with dozen other regiments of Astra Militarium. Calistarius had been a librarius for centuries. He was no longer the brash young Lexicanium, but a wise member of the senior librarius, equipped with powerful knowledge and Vitaris, his personal force sword. While fighting as part of the relief force for Hades Hive, tragedy struck the librarian. After fighting an inner war for centuries, Callistarius lost. He became a victim of the Black Rage. The man Callistarius was gone. Lost was the headstrong but yet empathetic librarian. The man who had struggled to relate to most of his battle brothers, but managed to confide in a very few close friends, such as the sanguinary priest Albinus and chapter master Dante, as well as his mentor Gaius Racilus. Visions and rage was all that was left. It was under the watch of his close friend and mentor Gaius Racilus that this rage-filled beast was inducted into the Death Company. The only thing left for him was an honourable death. It was in Hades Hive where he took part in the assault on the ecclesiarchal building and was one of the many trapped inside when the building collapsed during the battle. But Callistoros had survived somehow, but he lay trapped in rubble consumed by the visions and mind-numbing anger of the Black Rage. It was for seven days and nights Callistarius battled with this inner curse, spending every moment clawing back his sanity, taking that hateful directionless energy and controlling it, until on the seventh day he conquered it. As he emerged from the rubble, he was transformed, reborn into something or someone new. It was like he was someone else who'd watched Callistarius' life as an outsider, but knew every moment and feeling of it. But the transformation was so much more than that. The power that came with the Black Rage became an energy he could freely tap into. His body became more twisted and gaunt, looking less like a typical noble, handsome blood angel, but more a creature of pale rage. Callistarius is dead words he knew to be true, and a new name blazed across his soul. He was Mephiston. As Mephiston came to terms with his new form, he was set upon by orcs. Encased in charred armour, Mephiston strode forth, sprouting psychic black wings and soaring across the battlefield. It was within Hades Hive he unleashed this new power until he came across his friend Gaius Racilus. The other librarian was shocked to see his friend, who when they had last met, Callistarius had been lost to the Black Rage. Racilus called out for his friend, but Mephiston told him that Callistarius was dead. Peering into his soul, Racilus responded, Callistarius is not dead. I see him. He's still in you, even if you do not realize it. Whatever you are now, you carry an echo of the man you were. And so you must. I do not understand what this change means. I do not know what has happened to you. And I sense that you are just as confused. But you have to remember what you were, Callistarius. You have gone beyond the Librarius. I can see that. You are something new. Something liminal. I see your soul, and at the same time, I don't. Whatever this power is, it must be tethered tied to something human. You must remember yourself. 
I will remember. I swear. I believe you. Confusion is overwhelming Mephiston. He does not truly understand himself, but he is not alone, for some bonds can weather any storm. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight, and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I once was Callistorius. He has been dead for many years. I stand in his place, with death in my right hand, darkness in my left, and I would know who bears the name Mephiston. I have escaped the curse. The tales are true. However furious the fight, the usual hunger does not haunt me. My heart no longer pounds with those terrible lusts. I have escaped the doom of our chapter. I am unfettered, free to finally prove our nobility. I have the power to avert the grim fate that hangs over us. This slow, gnawing decline. This gradual death. Shortly after defeating the Black Raider and Armageddon, Mephiston's strength Psychic, physical, and martial surpassed those of almost all his battle brothers. He quickly rose to become the chief librarian of the Blood Angels, granted the title Lord of Death. His new power was frightening, and often where he strode in the Imperium, he was a figure of fear. Gone was the blue power armor of the Blood Angels Librarius, instead a sculpted red plate resembling raw muscle looking like a flayed man to the average person. But to those of the chapter, not all feared this transformed librarian. Some began to see Mephiston as a symbol of hope. One of their own had conquered the Black Rage, the curse of the chapter. This means that there is hope for the rest, and a way to avoid the loss of friends and brothers. This very hope is what has given Mephiston purpose as he strides the galaxy searching for a cure. As Gaius Racilus said, he must tie his power to something human. But the grim dark future is full of war and conflict, and the Blood Angels would face repeat disasters in 999 M41. Upon the world of Cybele, Brother Akiro of the Sixth Company had proclaimed himself to be the reincarnation of Sanguinius possessing the sacred chapter relic known as a Spear of Telesto, and white wings, just like that of the Primarch. It was Mephiston who travelled to the Blood Angel Shrine world of Sabian to judge Akiro and his followers, turning the powers of his formidable psychic gift upon him. As he delved within Akiro, he did not find divinity, instead the seeds of corruption, chaos. Mephiston then challenged Akiro to a duel, but before it began, Akiro's biological brother, Sergeant Rafen, a fellow Blood Angel, arrived and offered to challenge him instead. Eventually, Rafen emerged triumphant, impaling Akiro through the heart with the Spear of Telesto. Akiro died, begging for his brother's forgiveness. Akiro and many brothers of Sith Company were lost in this pointless civil strife. It was then that Mephiston and Rafen found the architect of this kinslaying, Malphalax, a greater demon of Zinch. By the time Rafen defeated Malphalax, it was too late, and the demon activated the black rage once again within Mephiston and the surrounding blood angels. It was only with the intervention of Rafen stabbing the spear of Telesto into Mephiston that they managed to release themselves from the curse. The man, Mephiston, had existed for over 70 years, battling for the Imperium and searching for a cure. 
but in reality the bodies would begin to pile up. As powerful as he was now, this civil strife had proven that he was still vulnerable to his own curse, and this journey was going to be bloody and would constantly test his humanity. Just as it would seem Mephiston could catch his breath, he suffered repeated dreams of the bloodthirster Kabanda, one of the most hated foes of the Blood Angels, appearing to destroy his chapter. This was combined with the haunting news that the Tyranid High Fleet Leviathan was on its course to Baal as well. The Blood Angel's doom was almost certain, but Mephiston would not go gentle into that good night. So a plan was constructed. His friend, Chapter Master Dante, sent the call to all of the descendants of Sanguinius to reunite into one legion to defend Baal from Leviathan, whilst Mephiston and the Librarius would kill the greater demon Cabanda. Mephiston, his friend Gaius Racilus, and the young disciple Lucius Anthros journeyed to the cruel mountains on Baal to undertake a ritual to open a portal to Korn's realm. Racilus had always felt that Anthros was too ambitious for power, and thought it was unseemly how this young lexicon saw Mephiston as a surrogate father figure. But Mephiston trusted him, and Baal was counting on them. The ritual began, and a portal into Korn's twisted hell was opened, and Mephiston struck at Kabanda in the hopes of ending the demon's threat before it could escape from the warp and destroy Baal. As powerful as Mephiston was, Kabanda was still a demon prince, and struck back at Mephiston, in turn offering immortal life to any of the librarians who revoked their vows to the Emperor. Though none answered, Gaius could see that Anthros was falling under the bloodthirster's sway and quickly told the Lexicum not to fall to the greater demon's false promises. Anthos frowned his resolve again, but this brief weakness left the flaw in the ritual, and Kabanda's next attack caused the librarians to collapse and the warp portal to close. Many of the librarians that took part in the ritual were killed by the backlash. Only Mephiston and a few survived, surrounded by the corpses of their brothers a symbol of their failure. As the other survivors wallowed in their despair, Mephiston rallied them to get up and aid in the defense against the High Fleet Leviathan. Perhaps it may have seemed callous to ignore the fallen librarians, but if overcoming the Black Rage had taught him anything, it was to keep moving forward. When the surviving librarians managed to rejoin their brothers, they found that their efforts had not been a complete failure as they had managed to redirect Kabanda to the moon of Baal Secundus instead of Baal itself, preventing the complete loss of the system. But to their horror, they had found a massive warp rift across the sky, splitting the galaxy in two, the Cicatrix Maledictum. Though salvation had come to Baal through the Indomitus fleet under the reborn Primarch Rebute Gulliman, Mephiston and the Blood Angels were stuck in Imperium Nihilus, blocked from the Emperor's light. The duties of Mephiston just became a lot larger. The galaxy burns. Baal and the Blood Angels were almost destroyed, but achieved a Pyrrhic victory against the High Feet Leviathan and Kabanda. Reinforced by the arrival of the Indomitus fleet, the chapter was given the Primaris Marines, genetically stronger and faster. This new generation of Space Marine would take up the fight in Imperium Nihilus. But something was wrong. Ever since the unveiling of the Cicatrix Maledictum, Mephiston had felt this psychic blindness, affecting his warp sight as he searched for the architect of the Great Rift. Mephiston journeys across the battlefields of the Imperium, looking for its source until reaching the world of Morsus, a Necron tomb world. Since the Great Rift opened, Mephiston struggles to control his power, 
he's constantly seeing ghosts of those caught up in his previous wars. In the meantime, Lucius Anthros, his protege, is on his own quest to find a means of preventing Mephiston from losing himself. He finds his way to the battle barge of the Sons of Helios chapter, who have seemingly not been corrupted despite their proximity to the Great Rift. This chapter teaches him the Sleepless Mile, a meditation reciting the words, We dream, dreaming, dream clearing their heart of taint. As Mephiston and Racilis search for the source of this blindness, Mephiston is slowly becoming more and more overwhelmed by the ghosts of his past, his power taking more effort to control than ever before. It was in the tunnels of Morsus the Blood Angels find the last Imperial Regiment survivors and a group of irradiated Ogrins. The Ogrins call him the Star Warrior and bring him to a secret underground temple, in which they show they have carved statues of him, telling Mephiston the Emperor had sent him to them, and they had foreseen this day. As this revelation is revealed, Mephiston battles with helping these Imperials versus his journey of finding the architect of the Great Rift, the ghost of the dead screaming at him, overwhelming him. Whatever this power is, it must be tethered, Tied to something human, you must remember yourself. At the point of despair, it was Racilus who brought him back. He reminded Mephiston that they fought for humanity. They fought for the Emperor. And though Mephiston had the responsibility to save all of the Imperium, they as blood angels should help those around them too. Even when we feel that we are lost and have nothing, we always have friends. Mephiston rallied and agrees to help the survivors of Morsus. The ghosts faded, happy. Mephiston had remembered what was most important. The forces of the Imperium set a plan to destroy the Necron's command tomb and save Morsus. It was in this brutal fight that Mephiston found the source of his blindness. A device called the Orchestrion. This ancient Necron tool had been dampening the warp and with Mephiston destroying it, he imploded all of the Necrons on Morsus linked to it too, saving the world. Back on the Blood Oath's bridge, Raceless asked Anthros if he learned anything of use from the Sons of Helios. Anthros lied and claimed they have nothing of use. Anthros was afraid, afraid of the judgement his lord would give him, if he had revealed what he had truly seen in the Sleepless Mile. He also kept secret the fact that the Sleepless Mile had saved him from the Black Rage. That at the end of this inner path, he saw a robed monk with an avian-shaped mask. You must be ready to burn yourself in your own flame. How could you become new if you had not first become ashes? Thus spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, a philosophical work exploring the idea of the Superman, the man of the future, the manifestation of the grounded human ideal, the transformation of Calistarius into Mephiston. This person will not follow norms and carve their own path. They will have to resort to violence in the name of great things. They will be selfish when it is strategic to do so. They do not resent the success of others. Suffering is part of achieving good things. However, this powerful figure is lonely, and they will also be conscious of how their strength scares others, but yet delight in their own power. When Calistarius was reborn, it was Mephiston who remained. At times he has seemed arrogant, selfish and reckless, but he possesses this incredible power which he uses to achieve noble goals, though at times he revels in it. It has also caused him great suffering, and the suffering following the Great Rift's opening only increased. It was during the reconquest of the Baal system, after the devastation of Baal, when the leadership of the Blood Angels was attacked by Kyris the Perverse, a Slaneshi greater demon. While repelling the demon, a black angel manifested behind Mephiston, matching his movement and attacking in unison. 
but this black angel was activating the black rage within the other blood angels. Ghosts. Black angels. Mephiston could barely contain his power. It was only with the intervention of Chapter Master Dante knocking him out were the other blood angels spared. It was becoming clear. Mephiston was dying, and his friends had no choice but to seal him in a sarcophagi, like when he was a recruit. For the boy who had never heard music, to a symbol of hope for the blood angels, it seems like Mephiston was going to end, devoured by his own power. However, a desperate gambit came with QVO87, a Mechanicus priest, who could give Mephiston the Primaris upgrade to briefly contain his power. As the procedure began, Mephiston lay on that cold operating table, and for a few moments, died. His soul was sent within the warp, where he saw a golden angel of light fighting an angel of darkness. A bloody masked angel spoke to him, told him the golden angel represents the nobility of Sanguinius' bloodline. Each time one of his sons created a work of art or give his life to protect an innocent, the golden angel grew stronger. On the other hand, each time one of the sons of the blood succumbed to the black rage and slayed his brothers, the angel of darkness grew. These angels have been fighting for an eternity influencing all life on Baal throughout all of time. The Angel of Darkness was winning, slowly overpowering this golden angel. The bloodied angel removed his mask, and it was Sanguinius. Mephiston had a choice. He was not like Rafin or any other who had battled through the Black Rage. He was a vessel for that anger. He could either die as he is now, or bear the rage and anger of his chapter and become an avatar for the Black Angel, and then eventually become it. If all of the struggles had shown him anything, it was that Callistarius, no, Mephiston, was enduring, and he would accept any fate so long as he could save his chapter. He would return. He would live. He would carry the chapter's rage in his soul. He would crush it with every drop of his blood, every day of his life, fighting it until he could fight it no more. He would choose darkness so others could be afforded more light, for a time at least. He could not avert the chapter's doom, but could battle it. He could slow it. By crushing it into his chest, he would be their bulwark against the madness, their shield against the inevitable. This was his inheritance. This was the truth behind his rebirth. This is what the angel required. By becoming a monster, he would buy his chapter a little more time. The surgery was a success. Mephison's soul returned to his body with a scream of psychic energy and he was lifted into the air with a vortex of material and psychic energy, igniting the black rage once again in those surrounding him. Large black wings shot out from the chief librarian, and a black lash filled the blood angel's command chamber. Unfortunately, this very wave killed a number of the chapter's librarians on the spot, but all of a sudden the power shifted, and Mephiston managed to contain his power drawing it back into his new Primaris form, stopping the black rage from flaring in his fellow angels. A haunting quiet descended upon the chamber. Onlookers were injured. Tragically, some were dead. It was Astograth the Grim, the slayer of the chapter's black rage victims who demanded that Mephiston be killed before it's too late, that he was too dangerous to be left alive. Dante silenced everyone and asked Mephiston who he was. He replied he isn't Callistarius, nor Mephiston anymore, but something else, something more. Gaius Racelis and Lucius Anthros peered into his soul, seeing that there was not just one, but three souls within his Primaris form, 
just as he was reborn within the rubble of Hades Hive, this person was new. It was once again thanks to his friends that the Lord of Death was spared. Dante, Albinus, Racilus and Anthros vouching for him. Mephiston was being consumed by his powers since the Great Rift, but finally, in his new Primaris frame, he was in control. But this new power had come with revelations he'd never expected. Dante, on the edge of death in the last stand against High Fleet Leviathan, had also seen Sanguinius, and the two spoke of their sightings of their Primarch. They could not confirm it was him. It might have been a warp illusion, or it's possible that it was part of the Primarch's soul that lingered in the warp. Mephiston knew that powerful psychic souls can survive in the warp for a while, and given that the Blood Angel's Primarch was one of the most psychic of the Emperor's sons, it was entirely possible. In a gathering of Chapter Master Dante, Albinus, Gaius Racilis and Lucius Anthros, Mephiston explained that he now saw psychically more clearly than he had ever before, that this great mystery of the Great Rift was tied to a demon, one that had been slightly manipulating them, even upon the events of Morsis, the Necron tomb world, a robed demon with an avian face. Mephiston saw that he needed to cross the Great Rift to disrupt whatever the demon had planned or was planning. Albinus voiced his concerns, not wanting to put Mephiston in dire danger again, especially during Imperium Nihilus. But Dante, like he always had, trusted Mephiston. Besides, he was never alone, for as long as he had friends like Racilus by his side. Though a centuries old librarian, Gaius Racilus beamed with pride. Luckily for Mephiston, he could not wish for a more loyal and trusting friend. Mephiston, Racilus, and Anthros travelled to the world of Sabasus, having used the webway to traverse the Great Rift. It was on this journey that Mephiston revelled in the control of his great abilities. He was able to possess the minds of even the Eldari, and even briefly able to stop time within a certain radius. Despite all of these gifts, Lucius Anthros felt that at most they were following an uncertain path. Perhaps it was luck that they were on this demon's trail. Or... Fate. Fate is never fixed. The moment we believe it is, we are doomed to follow the tune of whichever fraud sings the loudest. It's not fate that limits us, but our own short-sightedness and by knowing every possibility, I find a path between them, but there are no guarantees. My journey has led me to Sebasus, but only discipline, faith, and skill can bring me victory there. Anthros had had much doubt about Mephiston since the events of Morsis and the Sleepless Mile. The Sleepless Mile had given him a rise in his abilities, but he felt he couldn't share this with the one who he had once trusted like a father. But surprisingly, Mephiston trusted him, and in proof of this trust he gave him a relic staff of the chapter, telling him it would not fail him, even when he failed himself. The world of Sabasus was a strange and twisted place. Mephiston and Raceless found the surviving Imperials of the world who had seen azure armoured marines upon one of the nine mountains of the world. Ordering Anthros to stay behind, Mephison and Raceless journeyed to the Ninth Mountain, the Ninth Brother, to find an underground ritual being enacted. They found a robed demon with an avian face. Mephison made a desperate gambit and threw his body upon the ritual stone within the chamber. He then split himself in three. His body attached to the ritual, his mind flung to Raceless to help him fight the guarding Rubric Marines and his soul to chase the demon into the warp. A charred, flayed man, filled with rage, emerged into the warp, chasing the demon to the city of Tiska, the home of Magnus the Red and his thousand sons. Mephiston had managed to slaughter his way in, only to be trapped and pinned, his soul caught, his body burning on the ritual, and his mind desperately trying to save Raceless. 
But worst of all, the left behind Lucius Anthros had journeyed to the first mountain, defying Mephiston and trying his own way to stop the ritual, only to realize that when he was there, that he had been tainted, and he begun to transform into a demon. Mephiston, for over a century, had been subtly manipulated, all to the ends of a demonic ritual by Zadkael, demon of Zinch. It was over. Anthros railed in his failure, losing the very last parts of his sanity. But the words stuck to him. This staff won't fail you, even when you fail yourself. In the last moments of sanity, Anthros used the relic staff, polarizing the ritual. Instead of blending Zinch's realm into the galaxy, this banished the corruption from Sebasus, sacrificing Lucius Anthros. It had been a long journey. Mephiston can feel the weight of the centuries catch up to him. It had seemed so long ago that when he was a boy who had dreamed of becoming more, experiencing and participating in music, art, technology and culture as a blood angel, to being a member of the Librarius, struggling to relate to most of his brothers, to evolving into a dignified warrior who after centuries lost that eternal struggle against inner rage, to conquering that very darkness and becoming Mephiston, the Lord of Death, to struggling to hold on to his humanity against civil strife and demons, to being overwhelmed by that growing power and an act of selflessness taking on the darkest parts of his chapter. In the room of Lucius Anthros on Baal, Raceless and Mephiston mourned the loss of their young brother. The Raceless had never approved of the boy, he admitted that he was just beginning to like him. With his rebirth into a Primaris, Mephiston had seen more clearly than ever before, enough to see that his protege contained the taint of chaos within. But he used him anyway, seeing his loss as a means of success. It seems cold. Perhaps the more powerful you become, the harder it is to maintain your humanity. Perhaps this is how the Emperor felt. But in his own way, Mephison's sacrifice of Lucius was a redemption for his protege, his friend. For the bodies on this journey do truly pile up. The life of Mephiston is a grim, dark end. Though he defies his fate, he is destined to outlive his friends, his chapter, and everything he holds dear, everything that tethers him to being a human. Perhaps this is why he was worthy to carry on the burden of power, and no matter what obstacle he faces, he keeps moving forward. He turned his rage into an energy he could wield, power to keep him fighting until he can fight no more. Mephison will hold on to that humanity, that light, until all that is left is hate and rage. But he will not go gentle into that good night. He will rage. Rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on that sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. <laughs>